Okay, so our next speaker is Michael Poza from University of Pennsylvania. Thanks. All right, so a lot of people in the room really like simple models. I, I would, you know, uh, count myself among that group now. Uh, they're, like a lot of people have said, they're very low dimensional. They're often easy to analyze and control, and easy can mean a lot of things. Uh, maybe what Andy said, I think I take a slightly more expansive view of easy. Um, but, you know, things like brute force can often work, or even, you know, fancy control algorithms can work if we have, uh, have these easy models. Uh, things like inverted pendulums, you know. Bizarre. Alright, so. Uh, easy to analyze, uh, often very, very robust, and, and so I think at, at some high level these simple models have captured some intrinsic part of walking, right? These inverted pendulum models have really uh, discovered something. At the same time, you know, a lot of people in this room, also including me, really like more expressive rigid body models. You can get, you know, more dynamic, more efficient, something, something, uh, you know, sorts of motion, you know, higher speed, reachable, etc. Uh, often, because they're very tied to these complex models, they can distinctly lack robustness. So the very natural question, I think, sort of one of the emerging themes of this, of this section is, you know, what's in between these very simple and very complex models? Are there, are there quote unquote Goldilocks models, not too hot uh, and not too cold? And really the question there is, so what is a good simple model, right? That's sort of the defining question. And I don't have an answer to that. This is very preliminary work, but I wanna, I wanna kind of start thinking about this, this basic question here. So one metric, and this is sort of a work that, uh, that Tuan and I presented a couple of years ago here at Dynamic Walking, was to say a simple model is something that enables uh, you to recover from a wide set of disturbances. And then you can do, you know, do all of your fancy formal uh, numerical analysis on that. I would say, you know, kind of more generally, it's uh, a simple model is one that allows you to somehow still express a lot of dynamic behavior. So you can still get efficient gates, you can still get high speed gates, turning, uh, et cetera, you know, recovery, uh, control build, all the things that you want. Um, and put another way is that if we take our very complicated system with all of our actuators and we restrict it to act like a simple model, that somehow it hasn't lost a lot of performance. And I'm being very qualitative at, at the moment. Um, but we have to, when, we, when we're thinking about like this loss in performance, that's all with respect to that complicated model. That we can't ignore things like actuation limits and kinematic constraints of the complex model when we generate our simple model. Okay, so one view of thinking of these simple models is that they're really just manifolds, right? That something like the inverted pendulum just restricts your center of mass to act like an inverted pendulum to live on this arc uh, in state space. And the same would be true of a linear inverted pendulum model. So that you say, my simple model is a manifold, well now we can think about, you know, what's the best manifold, right? Uh, so suppose we're gonna define some manifold and we're gonna say my state trajectories have to lie on it. Now what's the best simple manifold? And we can cast that problem now as an optimization problem, right? So we're going to find some parameterization of this manifold such that if we restrict ourselves to lie on it, uh, then we still have good motion. Now, I want to say this is, this is different from this classical model order of reduction problem because we're not saying find a simple model that explains a bunch of data that we already have, but we're saying find a, bunch of, uh, find a simple model such that if we pretend to act like it, we haven't given away a whole lot in terms of you know, whatever our performance metrics are. And of course, we want to be able to do this for lots of different things. We want to be able to walk fast and slow and turn and so on. So we can think of this now maybe as a distribution over potential tasks. So all of the things I want my robot to do, let's just call those gamma. Uh, and we're, we're looking for this, uh, this manifold that minimizes, let's say, for instance, expected cost uh, over potential tasks. And we could write down some, some nasty looking problem, right? So minimize uh, with respect to our manifold the expected value of some trajectory optimization, right? That's, that's dependent on the, the particular task that I want to accomplish. Of course, this thing, you know, is basically unsolvable. So, you know, one approach might be to, to do something like stochastic gradient descent. So we're going to sample potential things that the robot might have to do, uh, maybe in batches. Uh, we're going to solve some trajectory optimization problems, and we're going to uh, take gradient descent steps and, and repeat. Now, of course, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of places you could complain about this idea, right? So what does the distribution look like? Uh, I don't know is the answer. I mean, we could think about sampling those from, from real world experiments. Whenever our footstep planner tells us the robot should do something, there's a sample uh, of, a, of a task. Uh, but there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of directions you could take this, this concept. So some very preliminary results. If we take a simple model, 
Uh, this is a slightly more complicated model. So take a Semendoff model and say, let's find a, a manifold uh, such that if we stick to it, we get pretty good motion, uh, and we can, we can do this stochastic and gradient descent-like like approach here. And so visualize is the manifold along with a number of different sample trajectories that are forced to lie in it, and this can include things at different speeds and different stride lengths and so on. Um, this is uh, looking only at the stance leg, so, so ignoring the swing leg dynamics, the manifold is restricting the stance leg and torso motion, if that uh, answers your question. This is, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the two-dimensional surface in a 4D space. Thank you, Andy. All right. Of course, just to, to throw this out there, not all models are really these manifolds. Things like slip don't obey this property. So slip is really a restriction on the dynamics itself rather than the state space that you can lie in. Uh, but we could write down a pretty similar looking problem here where we're going to look for uh, some reduced order parameters. I'm out of, out of time. Uh, reduced order parameters, uh, write down some co-location-like constraint that replaces that manifold constraint, and do the same thing for, for searching for a good uh, reduced order model. Okay? Uh, I think that the big you know, question here is we need to find a good model, uh, but we need to write down the right question first. If we can write down the right question, we can probably start finding, uh, finding good solutions to it. And we'll be getting a robot soon and trying this on the robot. Thanks. Questions? Oh, sorry, I'll get you a second. So if we look at control theory, uh, when people talk about good models, they typically actually talk about frequency domain models. And in fact, the part of the frequency domain model that's at something called the crossover point. So one could argue that all of these essentially state-space models are not really going to do what you want. That if, we, if what we care about is robust control, which is a very, in some sense, narrow thing, there are lots of other things we could care about, we really need to be thinking about frequency domain, we need to be thinking about things like delays, we need to be thinking about things that affect the, essentially the phase of the system near the crossover point. I think there's some, some truth to that. So, so Chris is saying that we really should be thinking about frequency uh, and crossover points um, because they have direct relationships to robustness in, in classical control theory. Is that close enough, Chris? Yeah, perfect. Um, I, I think there's a, a few problems with that from my perspective. One is, you know, these are really nonlinear models, and if we if we don't, you know, accept that they're nonlinear, we're missing a lot of the, the interesting things. And a big part of that for like a walking robot is really your control limitation. If you're ignoring your actuation limits and generating a lim, uh, you know linear model and looking at frequency, I, I think you're you're grossly oversimplifying the problem to the point where you're either generating a simple model that can't express the, the actual dynamics of your robot is very limited, or you're, you, you know, you're overexpressing the, the, the property. So I, you know, I, I think frequency is an interesting point in, in you know, a lot of, you know, when it becomes time to implement things on the robot, people often have to throw in some sort of hack to make sure your controller doesn't generate signals above some frequency. Um, but beyond that, I'm not sure it's the right question, personally. Any what, sorry? <coughs> Any LMIs? In what sense? Yeah, yeah, but what, in what, what context? Okay, yeah, I'm not talking about robustness right here. So, so yeah, if you wanted to talk about robustness, there's ways to do that for state space models too, but um, we can have this, the state space for frequency domain argument maybe offline. Uh. Um, hi. Uh, you said that uh, your question, uh, your search for a simple model means searching for the best manifold. Uh, but then, when building the manifold, aren't you actually assuming already a simple model, like, like the 3D, 3D degree of freedom uh, simple working model? So this is, yeah, I had like a 7 DOF model up here, um, but that's just a proof of concept. We could really, we could think about, you know, embedding a trajectory optimization of a 30 DOF system uh, where you still have a low D manifold that you're looking for. So that it's, I would say it's very preliminary you know, work in that area. Uh, when uh, people talk about simple models, 
Uh, one, 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 let me just say simple. You, you have these manifold, that is your simple model. There's two different ways of using those manifolds. One is something that you, that, you, that you constrict your model onto, and the other is something that you project your model onto in terms of interpretation. Mm -hmm. Were you just talking about the constriction version, or were you also talking about yeah. the projection so version? So I was talking and about also the... translate the questions to the other people. Yeah, so the question is, well, I think you did a pretty good job of, of asking it there. So are, are we restricting the dynamics? Sorry, are we restricting the, are we restricting the state space to a low-dimensional manifold? Uh, or are we, you know, finding some low-dimensional representation that does not restrict the state space? Uh, this was primarily the former. I think we can do the latter as well, and I didn't sort of blew through it at the end. Uh, but I think there's a very similar uh, stochastic gradient descent, like you know, embedded trajectory optimization problem could express the latter, where uh, things like like uh, slip, which don't restrict the state space, could could be handled. So in, in, in some ways, uh, this sounds a lot like the question of finding the optimal template or finding a good template for a system. Yes. Uh, how, how do you see that as sort of similar or different to that I, philosophy? I think it's the same question. Um, I don't know if there are solutions to that. It's the same question in different language, I would say. I don't know if there are solutions to that question that I'm just not aware of. Um, are there? I guess first, am I correct that your answer was you're considering the case where you are restricting to the submanifold? The example I showed is, but I think there's a very simple extension that does not have that mm. limitation. Um, so I guess my question is, you're talking about finding this Goldilocks zone of complexity, but uh, it seems to me the dimension of the submanifolds that you can stabilize and render invariant is uh, g generically speaking pretty much dictated by your number of actuators. Is that does that sound right to you? And if the, so, how can you how can you kind of find the right level of complexity if all uh, allowable manifolds have the same dimension? Um, so I mean, I, I'm not sh sure I agree with your, the statement there. I mean, the goal really is to find a low dimensional representation. So that once we have that, we can do uh, you know fancy control design and fancy planning in that low dimensional representation. Uh, that's still high performance. Um, and yeah, you have, enough, have to have enough actuators to get yourself onto that manifold, but I, I don't see that as being a problem here um, because we're not talking about, say, something like Fast Runner, which is grossly underactuated, maybe something that has enough control authority to get you onto the manifold. So for um, you, the complexity of the reduced model isn't a function of the dimension alone. It's also a function of what kind of control you have on the reduced model? Yeah, I mean, I think the... the the, what is the right dimension of the reduced order model sort of depends on what you want to use it for, right? Um, and, and that sort of depends on what algorithm your, you know, what complexity your, your control algorithm can actually handle at, at the back end, right? So, um, you know, that's why something like linear inverted pendulum is great because you can come up with closed form solutions to it. But I would say we can do better than 1D, 2D linear systems from a control theory perspective. So where should we add that complexity back into the very, very simple model uh, to get the most benefit out of it? Um, should the reduced model be uh, hybrid, and if so, how how would you plan to how would you handle that in this framework? Uh, it it definitely should um, is the short answer. Um, you know, I think I think as written, this formulation doesn't require any modification. I mean, it already is hybrid if you're just thinking about it as a restriction to, you know, of your state space, or even if you're thinking about it as a reduced order model of your continuous dynamics, you just have to extend that and add in your, your hybrid event dynamics. Uh, so I don't think it's a, a big change there, but it, it definitely has to be hybrid. Uh, 